Obviously, uh, there's a hurricane striking the East Coast as we speak. So um, I'm going to do a little bit of detour. Instead of talking about the, the starting with the thing I was going to, uh, that we're on schedule to talk about today, I thought we'd uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, hurricanes and storms uh, in, in the context of coastal management. So this is what, uh, where Florence is right now. It's just, just uh, uh, right on the, the exact coast, basically, of the eastern seaboard of the Carolinas in North Carolina here. And what we're looking at are wind, uh, wind, wind vectors and what the wind's doing. Obviously, um, hurricanes are uh, a cyclone, a cyclonic <coughs> disturbance. Whoa, you guys are getting violent back there. It's, it's the Florence is so intense, it's knocking over stuff here on the California coast, apparently. Um, but uh, this is basically a spinning mass of air with a bunch of more complicated stuff going on. And so that's what we're seeing. Um, we have had these storms, we have had uh, this type of natural hazard for quite some time. And this is, this is nothing new, although some of the flavor, some of the coastal management challenges um, are changing and are becoming, um, maybe we could say, a bit more challenging uh, these days. This is almost exactly a year ago today, um, and we were, uh, the, the 2017 hurricane season, last year's hurricane season, was quite destructive in terms of um, the U.S. and our, and our neighboring uh, countries. And at this time last year, we were seeing these, you know, one hurricane after another, after another, after another. Um, we are seeing that also uh, this year, but not, not, as, not as crazy, not as uh, quite as insane, thankfully, for us at least. There's a Category 5 storm about to hit the tip of one of our islands in the Philippines that is a, is a Category 5 that is, uh, I believe, last time I checked, before, before class started, we had 150 mile an hour winds. Those are very, very strong winds. Uh, Florence, it's hitting uh, the East Coast right now. It's, it's a Category 1, and, and it might, I haven't checked, it might even be dropping down. So recall one of our overall organizing questions for the semester is this. Has the coastal zone become too complex to manage robustly, right? And so that's something you guys are working on all semester to figure out yes or no, and what is your specific evidence to support that, that assertion? So, so some context here so we can properly understand Florence and whatever is coming down the pike next week and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, you know, this is sort of one of the uh, dime store novel definitions. What's addiction? What's insanity? Right? And people say these definitions that aren't really the real definitions of the American Psychological Society. But, but, but still, um, uh, the, I'd say these are more sort of popular, uh, popular notions. So insanity, we could call something like extreme foolishness or doing something that, that's, that doesn't make rational sense and, and, and doing that repeatedly. Um, one potential definition people have suggested would be coastal management, that it's totally insane to try to manage these very complex uh, uh, forces and issues and challenges. Um, you can also talk about something like addiction, where it's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I would say a lot of coastal management is like that, right? A lot of, our man uh, a lot of the areas where we've not yet figured out how to best manage our natural resources Sometimes people are just repeating, repeating, repeating. You are not allowed to do that. So stuff has become way too complex and way, the stakes have become way too high to repeat bad ideas or, or ideas that we are sure will not achieve the goal that we want. It is completely okay to try something that will fail, right? I would hope that they don't fail. But that's okay. What is unacceptable is for you to keep doing the same things that we know don't work. That's just stupid. That's wasteful. That doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the planet. It doesn't help people. It doesn't help whatever our, our, our interest is. And I would say that is insane to keep doing the same thing over and over again 
um, and just waste time, just waste money. We don't have that much time. We don't have that much money. This has not been, this is not a new phenomenon. So this is uh, what was originally the, well, it changed names, but basically a temple to a god, an old, old god. Um, this is outside uh, Ephesus in Turkey. And this looks really nice, right? It's a big, this is obviously an artist's rendition, but it's a big temple. It's on a hill, right? It's on a hill, so it looks kind of safe. This thing has been, this thing was destroyed several times, right? So the temple got destroyed. Now, maybe when the temple's destroyed, maybe we should say, hmm, maybe this isn't the best place for it, right? Maybe there's something about the, the lay of the land or the prominence of the rock outcrop or whatever it is. And, but clearly the folks that were in charge of the, uh, the temple were like, okay, let's build it again. And then boom, it got destroyed again. Like, okay, let's build it again. That is, um, uh, well, we don't have a temple there anymore. <laughs> we have ruins. I'll just say that. Um, we have been dealing with cyclonic storms in our part of the world for a long, long time, longer than we as humans have been resident in this particular area. So as soon as we came to this part of the world, we came to a part of the world that already had baked into its system, baked into its ecology, uh, storms. So uh, for example, this is, uh, here's some, now before the early 1900s, we don't have names for hurricanes. So we don't, this, there, this isn't a name, this is just the hurricane that, the hurricane that struck this location and this date is how people refer to them. But uh, this is um, an area in Texas. Uh, another area in Texas really sparked the modern, that gave, gave us our modern weather, weather system. A system that unfortunately some of your elected representatives don't see the value in continuing to fund. Like what, famously, I won't, won't say who it was, I don't want to go down that road right yet, but um, suffice it to say, uh, an elected representative that works in Washington, D.C. said things like, well, why do we need to pay for the weather service? We'll just get it from the Weather Channel, which is um, insane. There's no other word for that. Absolutely insane, dereliction of duty. That person needs to be committed to, to some kind of facility because the Weather Channel and whatever, they get all their weather from, they, they, they didn't put up those satellites, you put up those satellites. You and your parents and your grandparents and their tax dollars in our communal effort put together these systems to try to better understand. Now, this was birthed by, again, not named, but the Galveston hurricane uh, that struck, now Galveston. Galveston was the San Francisco of of Texas back in the day. So Galveston is where all the power players were. Galveston is where all the banking was. Galveston had an opera. Has anybody been to Galveston? So what's, so what, what tell us, what's it, what's it look like? What's, what is it? Okay. Okay. So it's out on an island. It's, it's not on the mainland. So now there's a bridge that connects it, but back in, back here, back, back, when this happened, it's, it's, a, it's a sand spit island. It's, it's a sh um, the other thing to say, since we're talking about, this normally comes up in, in another lecture, but since we're talking about this already, just to be clear for those of us that aren't from the East Coast or the Gulf Coast, completely different coastal systems ge geographically, right? So we here in California, we have earthquakes. We have one plate, tectonic plate, moving past another. We have geologically very young coasts. We have Big Sur. We have the Santa Monica Mountains, right? We have, by and large, we have an up-down coast, right? Thousand Oaks, which is just up the hill here, 500 foot elevation, right? Very close to the ocean, right? The Gulf Coast, the East Coast, those are very old uh, parts of our continent. So they're, they're, they're very eroded. So instead of steep up-down, they've been eroding for many more millions of years, and it's very flat. So if you're here, if you're at point, if we got in the car right now and we drove a couple miles, got to Point Magoo, picked up a rock, we threw that rock really far, it would arc up, it would bloop, hit the water, and it would sink, and it would be in, who knows, 50 feet of water, 75 feet of water, right? If we did that same thing here in Galveston, 
or off the floor of the panhandle or whatever, and we took that rock and we threw that, woo, throw it just as far, ploop, hits the water, and it goes down to maybe like three feet deep or something, right? So very, very shallow. That allows things like sand to build up and make these little barrier islands that Dr. Patch loves, if you guys have taken any of her classes. She loves the beach, right? loves the beach. Um, and so that's what this is. This is essentially a big sand spit. And all these folks were, and, and this was, so oil and gas was starting to boom and the Texas economy was booming. So there was a lot of wealth here. Mansions and you know, tons of folks and, and, and business and arts and all the cool stuff that a, that a thriving city has. This hurricane, and if you guys are interested, there's a great book called Isaac's Storm, if you guys are interested in this story, that talks about uh, this gentleman that was involved with this and, was, and essentially as an outgrowth from this, uh, really got going the, what we called then the National Weather Service. Uh, anyway, so this showed up in the middle of the night, massively strong hurricane, probably something like a category four, and categories of hurricanes are based on the wind, uh, the, the um, traditional uh, categorization of hurricanes, which we're still using. We will probably someday, pretty soon, go to a, a better system, but, but the traditional system is based on wind speed. So the more wind, the higher the number. It goes from a tropical storm, tropical depression, which in our part of the world is not a hurricane, Two, once it gets to, uh, once it starts to get strong enough, a category one, category two, which is stronger than one, category three, which is strong, et cetera, up to category five, which when we created that scale, that was the highest uh, number we thought we'd ever need. Um, okay, so, so this giant storm blasts in the middle of the night and it essentially levels the island. So what we're looking at here, so there are a few structures like this church here on the upper left that actually did survive stone uh, you know, masonry type stuff, but virtually everything else, as you can see in this lower left picture, was just completely destroyed. They were pulling bodies for weeks and weeks and weeks from underneath these essentially uh, broken uh, uh, matchsticks of buildings. What you look on the right there, that's a bunch of bodies piled up. It's day in, day out, pull bodies, pull bodies, pull bodies. Um, not great uh, numbers. Oh, my, my, my text. God, I'm misspelling everything today. I don't know what's wrong. I must be out of it. But it's somewhere between six and 12,000 people we estimated died. No good, no good rigorous numbers. This destroyed uh, Galveston. Now, there's still a Galveston. Obviously, you can go there and stuff. But it, it, was never, would, it will never again be the Galveston that it was. The power center left. The bankers left. The oil and gas, the energy sector that we think of so closely associated with Texas is now in Houston. So they decamped, they moved across the bay, and they went to Houston, and that's where they have remained, right? Um, and so in response, down here in the lower right, this is a postcard, a color postcard. A couple years later, they started building this giant seawall, which still exists. But the town never came back. Um, so this was uh, in 2008, this picture is in 2008, and this is a monument to folks that have, uh, have perished. And um, this is another hurricane coming straight on in. So we have this big giant seawall, which is literally a bunch of concrete armoring the island so it doesn't blast away. And um, this was only a category two storm here. And you see the water is already breaking over this um, statue's hand. So clearly Galveston survived the Hurricane Ike, but these, these, we're just gonna hunker down and put more armor on, that's a fool's errand, right? That's the best guess for people in 1903 as to what they should do. You and I, today, when we were faced with these challenges, I would hope that we could use some, um, explore some other alternatives that might be more robust economically, ecologically, in all of these uh, measures. Uh, it's also important to say, sometimes, such as right now, so if we turn on the, open up a news website or whatever, you can hear about hurricane, 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 right? Understandable. Uh, Florence is hitting, hitting the Carolinas. Um, but we shouldn't ever, in our class, turn only to American examples or American lessons. So for example, the world leaders in dealing with water and low-lying coastal land um, are, are 
you know, very, uh, many, many people would argue that, that the Netherlands, the epicenter for figuring out how to do this um, in a robust manner. So this is obviously, this is it, we're, right, low-lying area here in Europe. Um, when we see the old, the, the windmills and all that kind of stuff, that's, these were invented here, right? So, the, so these folks invented windmills to, to pump water, to move water, refine, do all kinds of uh, work. They've had a series of significant coastal floods driven typically by storm events, but, but flooding to the point where they've had massive devastation of their society and economies and, and agricultural output, et cetera. Um, uh, all throughout the, the um, last many centuries. Um, this continues, and, and so they basically diked their land. So they've created little dams, horizontal dams around land to keep the river out, to keep the ocean out, right? And so when they have problems, that defensive barrier has been breached, and that's what leads to the flooding, right? So most of their land is below, or a large chunk of their land is below sea level. Um, we have another big, huge flood, and that's what that picture is kind of dark, but up there on the upper right, <clears throat> that's just after World War II, and a huge, a, a, another large portion of the country goes subtidal for quite some time. And so at this point, these guys say, hey, let's use some modern approaches, modern um, thinking to deal with this. So they embark on a, what amounts to basically a 50-year plan to deal with this risk. And so they create this whole, uh, this whole structure. And what we're looking at here on this map on the left, so up to the, to the left here, this is the North Sea, the blue, the, the ocean. And then we're seeing all these uh, hydrological channels, these, these riparian channels, stream channels, et cetera, river channels. And these are various cities. Uh, huge um, shipping industry. So, so these guys not, aren't just living near the water, they're actively using their waterways and it's fundamentally uh, part of their economy. Um, and so they've taken a whole series of things that we won't talk about right here, but um, for example, they include things like this guy on the right that was just completed in 1997, right? So decades after they started down this problem. And what they've essentially done is they've created big walls, temporary walls. So normally, uh, these, these gates, these sort of swinging uh, axes, if you will, are retracted and they're here. So, so the water can go out, the water can come in, tidal action can happen, whatever it might, you know, shipping, cargo containers can go by, et cetera. But in those times when we might be particularly vulnerable, let's call it a high tide during the middle of storm season, right? Something like that. We're gonna go, okay, we're gonna rock these gates closed, not let ships go through for some period of time, days or weeks or whatever the, the case may be, more typically days. Um, and, and not allow the highest of the high water pressure to come on in, right? So we would call this a hard engineering solution. Now, is that what we should always do? I don't know about that. Is that incredibly costly? Yes, it is. But there are, the point is there's a variety of approaches we can take that do not mean destroying the entirety and pouring concrete over every single structure that's out there. Again, with our coastal management focus here, we're really interested in meeting the needs of different stakeholders um, at once, right? Um, here is uh, close to where the um, hurricane is hitting. And some of that video that I, that I um, sent around last night uh, to, for you guys to look at, this was from, some of that stuff was from Topsail Island. Uh, did I tell you guys the story, the story of the wedding I went to, the Topsail Island? Did I tell you that guys the other week? No, okay. So I'll tell you this quick story. So this is so this is again a barrier island type situation. So a sand a, a sand spit that's not on the mainland per se. It's a little teeny bit off the mainland. It's off the North Carolina coast. So this is this friend of mine who was a dive assistant for me, and he was getting married. And he married. Uh, so he was a dive assistant for me, and then he, after diving with me for several years, he said, "I want to be a lawyer." So I don't know what I did, but I drove him out away from being a field scientist. Sorry, sorry, Mike. Um, uh, Anyway, he, um, so he was getting married. He's from, he's from North Carolina. He fried everything. He would bring out to the to diving, he'd bring out a fry daddy, so he'd fry everything. What about that burrito? You can't fry a burrito. Yeah, I can. You know, fry up the burrito. Um, so, uh, and he loved ACDC. Uh, anyway, so, um, so we, go to this, we go to this wedding, and 
again, it's not like California where everything is public land. Right there, if you own property and it goes down to the water's edge, nobody can go on your property. Right? So you, can, you own your beach and nobody can go trespass on your beach. So that's sort of weird. The other thing we get out there is, again, it's not California. We have a biased view of the coastal zone here in California. So their, their you know, high elevation for these guys is like mm, three feet above sea level, you know, something like that, right? Our tidal range here in California, maybe it's gonna go up three feet, you know, plus three feet, and then low tide's gonna go down minus four feet or something. You know, we have typically several, several feet, you know, a meter, a couple meters easy in a day. Here, this part of the world, these guys have more like an, a foot range in a day, right? So the, 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 the typical tides are much more muted, the land is much lower. So I walk out and they have this big, huge two-story house. It wasn't his house, it was his uh, fiance's family's house. And so I'm looking at it, I'm like, holy cow, facing the ocean. Really cool place to have a party, right? But I'm thinking, wow, dude, we're just a couple yards from the, from the water. And I said, wow, this is crazy. Um, it, seems like, uh, it seems like this is really vulnerable to hurricanes like we're having right now. And he says, oh yeah. I said, wow. And I said, I can't believe uh, you know, this thing hasn't been nuked. And he says, uh, oh yeah. No, it has been. I'm like, what? He goes, oh yeah. And uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, last time a hurricane came in, it filled up the entirety of the first floor. So, so you would walk in and you'd be walking into the second floor. So the, so the dune essentially became the house, right? And I was like, what? That's crazy. And I said, wait, the last time? He goes, yeah. So how, how many times has this happened? Three times. Three times? Oh my God, that's totally crazy. How long, have they owned this, how long has your family owned this house? For like 75 years or 100 years? 11 years. So wow. I guess they're lawyers, that's wow, pretty cool they can afford that. They didn't pay for it. FEMA paid for it, you paid for it. For their second house, these guys don't live there, this is, this is, this is their summer pad, right? So it's good to know friends that have summer pads. It's hard to have paid for one, but it's good to have friends that have summer pads. So this area has been beaten by hurricanes like we're seeing right now, like Florence, for ever the system is set up such that anybody that, that's impacted by a natural hazard that's a little bit oversimplification but basically uh, everybody is allowed to put money is, is allowed to ask for um, help right doesn't matter if you're making ten thousand dollars a year or if you're making five million dollars a year right and we can maybe say maybe that's an appropriate thing right in this democracy and everybody has access to social security and everybody should you know, have this. But we might kind of say, huh, maybe after the third time of us paying for someone's second house to be cleaned out, maybe there should be some limits on that, uh, right? That provides a, um, a disincentive to have robust, good, strong management, right? If there's no downside, dude, right? Let's drink beer every night, right? If I get a ticket and was drunk driving or something and it just gets wiped away, ah, just keep drunk, drinking and driving, right? Uh, these, not that we wanna punish people or something like that, but we need to have properly incentivized uh, management. And I would argue that places like Top Sail Island have not had proper um, signals or, or, or not as good as they could have been. Again, this is not just limited to one particular place or one particular setting. This is, this is uh, Miami Beach. Uh, one thing that can be, okay, so something we'll talk about uh, later, uh, but um, is this notion of how do we measure stuff? So one of the things we've been doing in the lab the last, uh, so the first week we looked at sort of a, you know, a, a more standard data set, people, right? How many people are here? Let's look at this people data set. Okay, cool. Next, we, um, we looked at, uh, uh, the Ocean Health Index, right, which was something related but not exactly. Another example of a type of data set that might be uh, valuable um, are, are increasingly the kind of things that you and I might, might uh, come up with. And so I just thought we'd look at this really quickly. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Folks, the 
National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration recently confirmed that this has been the worst year for disasters in U.S. history. From the tornadoes in Missouri to the Hurricane Irene to Newt Gingrich's presidential campaign. <laughs> Luckily, his staff evacuated months ago. <laughs> so it has been a bit of a busy year for FEMA. Now, folks, you know I've never been a fan of federal emergency management. Who is the government to tell me my house has become uninhabitable? The raccoons have settled in just fine. <laughs> but FEMA has finally done something right. Jim? FEMA revealed that they partially gauged the severity of a disaster based on the condition of Waffle House restaurants. The agency uses a Waffle House index. The southeastern chain prides itself on operating during severe natural disasters. FEMA says if a Waffle House location is closed, they know that area needs aid. Yes. The Waffle House Index. Because in America, it is only a disaster once it disrupts our supply of chicken fried meats. <laughs> now, FEMA ranks an area's post-disaster condition based on a three-color scale. Green means the Waffle House is open and serving a full menu, okay? <laughs> like, uh, like this one right here, okay? The Waffle House being able to serve their full menu is a sign that damage in the area is limited and that Lipitor is plentiful. <laughs> now, yellow means the Waffle House is offering only a limited menu or this, their photo menu, okay? <laughs> Indicating area residents probably have limited power and food or are too drunk to read. <laughs> okay, now, red is a sign of severe damage. The Waffle House is closed, or in the example of post-Katrina, Mississippi, reduced to nothing but a slab. <laughs> By the way, nothing but a slab is how you order the chicken fried meats. <laughs> Folks, it is no accident that Waffle House has become FEMA's syrup-smothered canary in a coal mine. Also, available on the menu. <laughs> After Hurricane Katrina, when restaurants that reopened quickly were swamped with customers, Waffle House executives developed a manual for opening after a disaster, bulked up on portable generators, bought a mobile command center, and gave employees key fobs with emergency contacts. Not to mention their strategy of slowly turning their customers into flotation devices. <laughs> but folks, as much as I think it is a good move by FEMA, I say we cut out the government middleman and put the Waffle House in charge of all our emergency <laughs> operations. <laughs> These people have been drunk at 3 a.m. <laughs> For instance, did you know in a flood zone, short stacks also double as sandbags? <laughs> and somehow, 60,000 of them still cost just $2.99 <laughs> with your choice of chicken fried meat. <laughs> I say, better to go with a sovereign American Waffle House than the UN's humanitarian breakfast response, the International House of Pancakes. <laughs> they will just pass a useless, non-binding resolution declaring the disaster Rudy Tooty not so fresh and fruity. <laughs> we'll be right back. Different tools for different situations. So sometimes that means we should have different um, you know, engineering responses. Sometimes we need different metrics to see what the condition of our coastal zone is. And so in, in the disaster context, we're even more challenged than normal, than, than we normally are, and it's hard to find stuff. So actually things like the Waffle House Index can be actually quite useful, right? At a, at a larger, sort of larger scale. Hey, did this area, how whacked did this area get, right? Just like our Ocean Health Index, the Waffle Index is trying to integrate a bunch of things and put it into one number. Is it red, green, or, or, or yellow, um, et cetera. <clears throat> all right, so we talked about, uh, so addiction is, you know, all kinds of problems like that. Traditional coastal management, I would say, um, is changing coastal, and, coastal land and seascapes to maximize short-term human utilization despite often degrading the ecological services. Um, because we haven't really considered that. This is traditionally, not, not necessarily everything we're doing now, but if we go back, uh, back in the day. So to, as a refresher, um, let's make sure we're all on the same page with ecosystem services. Ecosystem services can uh, 
classically be broken down into two broad categories, functions and values. Functions are the bio, biological, geochemical, the, the goings-on of the system, right? So the growing of the grass, the, the pollinating of flowers, whatever, whatever the thing is, absorbing of water, whatever the case may be. Value is obviously related to that, but value is the worth that you and I, or that society as ascribes to whatever that particular function is. So function is the thing, value is how, how it, it has uh, worth to us. So for example, if we're talking about something like coastal wetlands here, we could say a wetland can support stable populations of fish and plants and this and that. And, uh, and maybe if we have a bunch of, of, of stable populations of things like birds, Maybe we can go out and watch the birds, right? So we can generate some revenue. We can sell some people some binoculars. They'll come and stay in our hotels. They'll pay for parking, whatever the case may be. Um, high productivity. So these plants and, and animals and everything grow really fast compared to other areas, other, other ecosystems. So that would be the function. The value might be, oh my gosh, now we have enough critters that we can eat, either for, you know, go hunt recreationally or hunt for sustenance or something like that. We could talk about biogenic structures or, or life, uh, you know, structures from living material. So uh, grasses, kelp, uh, uh, things of that nature, those guys can act to minimize the erosion. Let's say if we have a storm that comes up, uh, up the uh, coast that has waves in our, in our coastal wetland, by having a lot of these plants around the area, we're getting the benefit of, of the, the soil and the sediment being protected. And then another, the last example here would be if we are, again, talking about uh, coastal wetlands, we have a lot of silt, a lot of fine stuff. Those things tend to act and, and tend to make complexes with metals. Take them out of solution, take them out of free association so that they're bound up. And so uh, that's, that's the basis of people talking about coastal wetlands as being pollution sponges. And so the benefit that you and I get is they essentially act as water filterers or, or water cleaner uppers. Cool? So ecosystem services, functions, and values. Um, uh, we'll talk for a little bit here, then we'll take a little break, I guess, is what we'll do. So, um, and we can, we can talk about all these different, um, there's a million different ways we can um, look at a system and talk about the particular functions and values. Here's one small one. This is, this is over a decade old now, um, but this is one of the first uh, uh, really nice examples of this. This is uh, some, fo some folks that were looking at the value of coastal wetlands in the context of stuff like we're seeing today that's unfolding in terms of coastal storms and things. So what they did was they first said, okay, well, let's see if we can get an estimate on this. Let's look at how much coastal wetland exists on the Gulf Coast and the East Coast. And so they, they pulled together data and some areas have a lot, some, some don't have quite so much. Um, and then uh, we talk about uh, the, the marginal value of these, um, of these wetlands, how much, how much they're worth. Um, on a per unit basis scale. And then we get the total value on things like uh, sh shoreline protection. So by having these wetlands here, they're protecting all the other infrastructure, all the other, our houses, our highways, whatever it is. And so we're getting some net benefit. And again, with all these numbers, the, the, the lowest value is dark and it's ramping up to the, the brighter or the, or the whiter color. So if we look over here on the right, what we see is um, because some of the infrastructure, some of our societal worth is, um, low, is more concentrated in certain areas, such as uh, like up around New York and Massachusetts and stuff like that, that's, those wetlands become even more valuable, right? So they're saving more expensive um, uh, sky high rises or skyscrapers or stuff like that. So one, one example of ecosystem services. Traditional coastal management um, is traditionally some type of manipulation of the landscape, not of people. It's manipulating the landscape. And, and this is uh, how we tend to approach that. Uh, the goal is to um, make, this, make these landscapes, make our coastal zone work for anything you and I want to do. So the first example in the Western US, Western US, 
sorry, in the Western world, I should say, the first example in, uh, of doing this in a rigorous way would be the Romans. So the Romans had very clear, very discreet approaches to draining coastal wetlands, wetlands in general, but especially coastal wetlands, so that they could do other things, right? And so that really set us down this, this path of, hey, this ecosystem is not really valuable to us. Why? <laughs> because I want to do something different with it. That, that's, originally, that was the entirety of the, the logic structure, right? And so we, traditional coastal management, inherited that. Um, yeah, and so, and so it goes without saying, uh, this isn't thinking about all the different stakeholders, all the different resources, et cetera. An overriding concern here would be, uh, one, allowing humans to do whatever they want there, but then also to protect human life. So, so, so make it so people don't die is the overall goal. Ecosystem service is not considered. And the primary way to, to get at that management is to, is to do some manipulation of the landscape, some engineering manipulation, especially with stuff related to water. Um, uh, a lot of this involves some type of engineered or hard structures. So putting something in, a, a barrier, a seawall, um, changing the stream bed, something of that uh, nature. And almost all of it acted to simplify the landscape. Big complex, big bumps, big, big rugosity, something like that. Ah, that's too hard to deal with. Let's make it smooth. Let's make it a consistent slope. Let's make it a, a, a flat wall. Let's make it a horizontal uh, plane, whatever the case may be. And the general approach is to whatever that stressor might be, wind, uh, waves, uh, make it go away as quickly as possible. Make the w waves go away. Boom, boom. Uh, if, it, if it's dealing with rainwater and we're talking about Los Angeles, get, make water go away. No, no, go away water. We'll, throw, we'll, we'll pave the river and throw all the water in the river and have the river, river water get into the ocean as fast as possible. And, and we're living with the consequence of, the, of those poor decisions uh, back in the day. And then uh, lastly, I just say a lot of traditional coastal management involved uh, historically introducing novel organisms to help us with that. So the stuff that wasn't a hard engineering was a so-called soft engineering or a biological engineering where we took invade what have become in many places invasive plants and throw them on the landscape to stabilize the dune, to stabilize the cliff, to stabilize the bluff top, something like that. So the landing page looks like this when you guys are... This Again, where, wait, where's our, where's our track? Okay, here's our track of Florence right now, right? As we talked about at the beginning. So it's, it's, uh, coming, it's coming on shore. Uh, let's, Dr. Patch's family has not evacuated their home on the coast in South Carolina. Many other people haven't, right? This is a common phenomenon, not just in the coastal zone management, in disaster management in general. Fires, uh, tornadoes, what, whatever the case may be. Some people, for a whole variety, some people can't physically leave because of health reasons or, or something like that. They might not have a vehicle to, to get into to move away, maybe. They might have some health thing. Maybe they have a, some dialysis thing where the machine has to be plugged in. Or, there's all kinds of million different reasons. but. There's also people that just say that are totally capable of going or, or relocating, whatever, but they're worried about being robbed, right? Which is a non-trivial thing, right? After the Thomas fire, all kinds of people were robbed, right, in, in Ventura. So, the, so it's not as if people are totally irrational, but um, sometimes people are, are making interesting decisions, I guess I would say it like that, right? And ones that from afar, we might look and go, what, that person didn't take that action or they didn't do that and stuff? So let's take a look at this, All right? Let's take a look at this. So what I want you guys to do is go to, so it looks like this, hit launch. And I want you guys to go look at the historic hurricanes that have hit South Carolina, North Carolina, et cetera. If you want, there's a short video here. It's just like two, three minutes. I don't think you need it. You guys can figure it out. But, um, but, but if you, oh shoot, I just need to launch it. Um, but if you hit launch, you guys can play around with it. I want you to play around and look at historic hurricanes uh, for five minutes or so uh, in the Carolinas.
And so you can, you can do hurricanes, right, which are what these are. These are hurricane tracks. You can look at, you can look at uh, coastal counties and the density or the frequency with which they've experienced uh, hurricanes, right? They're, all these things are play aroundable with. So I want you guys to just play around for four or five minutes with those guys. Okay, so what's the interpretation? Too many hurricanes. Too many hurricanes? There's a lot of hurricanes. Right? Hurricanes are tropical storms. These aren't all necessarily hurricanes, but, but yeah, right? A lot of storms, right? A lot of unnamed storms. Say again? A lot of unnamed. A lot of unnamed ones, right? Yeah, so, so um, uh, only the recent ones, have, well, only, only in the modern era have they been named, but also if they don't reach a certain size, they don't get a name. So if it's a relatively small one, it doesn't get a name. We call these things hurricanes in our part of the world. In the um, in the Pacific, uh, in the in the Western Pacific, we call them typhoons, but it's the same same exact thing. What else? Any other observations you guys have about the the break directions in the Milky? The the I'm sorry, say it again, Melvin. Uh, oh well, on mine there's like a bunch of grays, and it's all coming from the northeast. So you're saying that the northeast is is the bigger is the higher concentration? Oh wait. Okay. You can just look by this is South Carolina. This is just South Carolina. Okay. Right, right. So you can you can you can look at the whole region. You can pick it just a state. You can you, you can pick your geography or your your binning of the data if it's too noisy. Where's the current one, Jimmy? Southern North Carolina. Uh, basically, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So here's our here's our current one. Where is it right now? Here's our current one right here. If you guys are. So pretty much just on the just on the border, yeah. If you sort by intensity, it's a very Right. Yes. So we so so the, the the problem the problems of the the management challenges have been growing. So one of the challenges that we have here is this notion of uh, seeing the world in political boundaries. This is the United States. This is my county. This is my state barrier, a boundary, whatever it is. And obviously, there's 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 good reasons why we have political boundaries, and and you know, uh, who's collecting our taxes and all that kind of stuff. But in many cases, these political boundaries are not helpful in the context of resource management, particularly in the context of coastal uh, zone management. So, for example, here is a Hurricane Camille which struck the city of New Orleans in 1969. And uh, the color here just refers to the strength of the, of the wind, how intense the storm was when it went by. And this is the storm track. One of the things that all the media was talking about this, in this past uh, week leading up to Florence hitting the Carolinas was uh, this could be the strongest storm to hit that part of the country since 1954, right? I wasn't alive in 1954, right? You guys weren't alive in 1954. So one of the issues that also plays into how we respond to disasters is what our personal experience with that disaster is. And if, and if, so I would suggest if you were really screwed by the Thomas fire, the next fire that's going to come through, you're going to be like, whoa, dude, we're out of here. Boom, boom, let's pack up and go, right? If you were someone that, um, you know, the Thomas fire was kind of a thing, you're kind of on the edge or you're outside the main area and you're like, oh, that was kind of a problem, but mm, you know, it was okay, right? You're gonna be a little bit, I would argue, probably less likely to the next time a fire comes to really jump on and get out the first thing, right? So that's just human nature. So in the case of, uh, with Katrina, Hurricane Katrina um, that hit New Orleans, this was the last storm to hit it and meant, this was before I, even I was born. Wow, that's old. And so the memory wasn't there. And everybody was using an incorrect mental, uh, mental tool to frame the challenge. They said, I don't remember anything hitting here, whereas they were not playing with this tool that you guys were just playing with. If they were, they would have seen this. So this is all, these are all the storm tracks 
from 1969 to 2005 to right before Hurricane Katrina struck. This is the proper context. So just because this a storm didn't follow this particular path for several decades does not mean that it was cool to not worry about it, right? This is the proper context. This is like, oh my God, all these lines, which you guys were just playing with. Oh my gosh, there's all these lines. That is the reality of the system. Just because you've been so fortunate or f so lucky to have avoided a major, major you know, direct hit doesn't mean that you shouldn't be expecting that, fully expecting that to be a normal part of your home, your city, or whatever. We know all kinds of things about hurricanes. For example, we know, so this is a funky map. Can you guys see this or is it too dark? Um, it might be a little dark for you to see in the back, but this is, this is a, a weird projection. This is the whole globe we're looking at. Here's Antarctica, here's South America. And this is, uh, so uh, we just, one of the comments uh, we were talking about was the fact that, that these hurricanes are, are intensifying, right? So we can see that here. So this is, um, this is the relative increase in, in cyclonic storms over time, right? So this is, doesn't matter, at this point it doesn't matter what it is, it's back in the day till now. And then the coloration here, the color ramp is how strong those winds are. And these are all these storm tracks plotted. Gazillion million, it looks fuzzy because there's so many storm tracks plotted, right? And what you see is around Antarctica, nothing. You'll never have, or at least, <laughs> Those things totally change, even more crazy. We don't have any uh, uh, cyclonic storms right around Antarctica. We'll talk about why when we have our Antarctica lecture. Um, but we see, we see some natural bands, right? So here's the equator. At the equator, there's no cyclonic storms or no significant cyclonic storms. Where are they? They're just south of that band that, that, that girdles the equator and just north, right? With most of these guys being uh, in the north. So check this out. So here's, here's us in North America. Look, here's this big, huge concentration. These dudes are all coming wang, right, to, to smack us in the Gulf Coast and the, in the eastern seaboard. So that's, that's the reality. That's how we should be preparing ourselves. Um, and not only are, are, the, are there more storms, so this, this goes from 1980 to a couple years ago in terms of the axes here. And we're going, and so this is the different category of natural disaster. If you guys can't see it in the back, this light blue is geophysical events. So this light blue is earthquakes. So the earthquakes haven't changed that much, right? They're, they're more or less the same, same number of earthquake events uh, overall. Um, uh, meteorological events uh, growing. Right, so the bars are, are, are relative, I mean, and again, there's noise every year, so some years are worse, some years are better, but overall, the purple bars are, are larger than they were over in 1980, as we go to the right of the graph. Uh, hydrological events, which would be something like a flood, a rain, rainstorm that induced a flood or something, same thing. The red bars are getting uh, larger as we go through time. Um, and, then, and then climatological events, this would be uh, most typically things like extreme a, a hot spells, heat spells, things like that, right? The blue bars here are larger than they were in 1980. And then associated with that is the top graph, which is how costly are these disasters, right? So not only are we having more of them, the effect that, the, and not only are their winds stronger or whatever, but they're also inducing more damage. This is at a time when we are not necessarily improving our ability to respond to these disasters be it Florence, be it, be it Katrina, whatever it is. So what this figure is, this figure shows us um, uh, insurance, right? So, so as a whole in this region of the world, how much of the infrastructure is insured? That could be personal home insurance, that could be corporate business, and, you know, it could take various forms. But this is uh, the big picture. And what we find is in North America, a bit, just about half, slightly more than half, uh, uh, of the damages are covered. So even in our wealthy country that has all this resource, all these resources, all this, all this infrastructure, all this disaster planning and everything, still about half of the impacts from these natural disasters, are n nobody's paying for them but us. As soon as we move to any other region of the world with a possible exception of Australia, which is just, it's a continent, but it's just one country, right? But as soon as we move to any of the other areas, we find is the vast majority of the costs are borne by the individuals. 
So that's a hardship for our society, it's a hardship for our culture, that's a hardship for our town, our neighbors, whatever. That, is, that suggests that our management is not as great as it could be, right? Because these things we know are coming, these things are gonna happen, and we don't have the, the infrastructure tools, the societal tools to try to mitigate um, the worst of that for people. So that means when this happens, man, maybe your neighbor isn't gonna rebuild his or her house. Right? Maybe they're not going to restart up their business because they, they maybe just can't afford to or something. Right? So if we choose this, if this, is, if this is an active thing that we decide was well, how we want it to go, that's one thing. But I would argue that these things oftentimes happen without much debate and they sort of are a consequence of other things that we're not necessarily thinking all the way through. Okay, so reduce capacity to recover. When we ask people, uh, and this is a question that we've, we asked in the past with our surveys, but we say, hey, what should we do? Um, and then the, I told you guys a story, right, about, the, about the, the coffee shop in Malibu. So uh, in 2007, we had these really bad fires in Malibu where it burned up a whole bunch of Malibu. I just so happened I was doing some work in a wetland, and so I, I stopped in this coffee shop to get a coffee, and in front of me were uh, some Malibu folks and uh, they seem to be relatively wealthy, I'll just say that. And so they're in front of me in line and they were talking and one of the, I wasn't trying to sp spy or whatever, but they were, they were talking very loudly and so I could hear their whole conversation. And so it, uh, these uh, folks were talking and they said, oh my God, and they started got talking, one of the ladies' mansions burned down, had just burned down, right? Which sucks, right? Even if you're rich, that sucks, right? Poor, that sucks. It sucks to lose your home no matter who you are or where you are. So they're talking. And so um, there's also been some stories about uh, New Orleans uh, uh, earlier, uh, right before um, the previous week. And so um, they, these guys, these folks are talking about New Orleans and everything. They're saying, oh my God, you know. And I was, at first I was going to say, oh hey, I work in New Orleans. And, but I didn't. They're like, oh yeah, it's so sad what happened to those poor people. You know, those people are so sad. But we probably shouldn't rebuild because, you know, those people built their, built their city underwater. Like, that was totally stupid, you know? And, um, and so they had their conversation. I was like, I'm just, you know, I'm not, I don't want to interject. I'm going to let them have their thing. And then after a couple minutes, it, it turned to their own home. And that's when this one, uh, one of the people in conversation said that her mansion had burned down. Uh, and... The other lady said, oh my God, that's so sad. I feel so bad. So are you guys going to rebuild? Oh, totally, she said, right? Not getting the irony, which is when it happened to those people over there and they were in a dangerous zone, they, it's really sad, but they shouldn't rebuild. But for her, in fire-prone area, of course you should rebuild, like no question. Um, but it turns out that what we see overall is, is a pretty similar pattern. And so this, the lower question here is, should we rebuild after a coastal disaster like Hurricane Katrina? And, and you guys had these questions. Uh, and then should we have rebuilt after the Malibu fires? And what we see is uh, they're, they're pretty similar. A, they're a little different, but by and large, most people still say, yeah, the majority of stuff we should rebuild, or if we were to add the majority and at least parts of stuff, which we would add the parts response to the majority response to the, the overall response, just about everybody thinks we should rebuild um, uh, uh, the, at least parts, if not the majority of stuff. So what's, what becomes the mechanism for us to do, to do better, right? If, if everybody wants to immediately rush in and rebuild, what are we going to do? And this has led to all kinds of political fallout, which we don't, I don't typically like to talk about politics in this class. It's not a politics class, and a lot of times this gets in the way of the science and stuff, but um, there's no way to not talk about the politics in terms of this stuff, particularly this week with some of the silliness that's been going on. In the case of uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, which, which uh, I know very well, and some of you guys have come with us to New Orleans, and maybe some of you guys will come with us this year to New Orleans, but um, political stuff all over the place including our friend Ivor Van Heerden, who was a scientist that helped um, ex interpret, explain, um, created some of the tools that were used by first responders to pull people out of uh, flooded houses and things like that. Um, he was fired from Louisiana State University because he criticized essentially the Army Corps of Engineers and they really liked the Army Corps of Engineers. Not 
not a first principle discussion, what should we do, but they acted to undermine this scientist, this, uh, this person operating from facts, and, and since then, he's, books have been written about this, and he's gotten, and th this is a political cartoon saying that he, he got this, uh, this award for political courage, but it doesn't matter, LSU still fired him. And so LSU now no longer has a hurricane center because he was the assistant director of the hurricane center. So no, no, to get rid of him, they had to dismantle the hurricane center at the largest public university in Louisiana in a coastal state. You might think that you would probably want a hurricane center in a place that's nuked by hurricanes, right? Um, and so there's, of course, all this, all this silly stuff that, uh, uh, did I send this video to you guys? I'll show, this, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this video. What, what can we expect from the shitstorm? Uh, Trevor, if you were thinking of logging on the Twitter, you might want to think again. Two Trump tweets have already hit Washington, D.C., and these are Category 4. Category 4 tweets. This is bad. None of that low-level kafifi shit right here. <laughs> the entire East Coast is about to be flooded deep in the bullshit, man. I'm talking about real bullshit. And by Sunday... You can expect Kellyanne Conway coming out doing cleanup, telling us how the president didn't mess up in Puerto Rico because there's no such thing as a Puerto Rico, and you're a racist for thinking there is. The bullshit's coming, man. Kiss your family. Back to you, sir. But the political stuff has gotten crazy, right? I mean, there's always been politics. There always will be politics involved with these kind of issues, but it's gotten to the point now where we can't even discuss the basic facts. Because some folks see facts as a, a, a politically, um, or, or something that, that, that's, that's, and of course we always debate things and what, what is reality, but, but you guys know what I'm saying, right? I mean, I mean the undermining of, of basic information um, is crazy. And so that was this, which you guys, I sent this guys to you guys, I sent this video to you guys, but we'll just watch it. The disaster from Hurricane Florence, the president is defending his response to last year's disaster in Puerto Rico. In fact, today, President Trump disputed a study on the death toll from Hurricane Maria, which hit the island almost exactly one year ago. Yeah, President Trump accused the Democrats of using those numbers to make him look bad. A CBS 2 political reporter, Dave Bryan, is here now to break it down. So, you know, the way our society is today, you even have the politics of hurricanes, sure. and that's what we're dealing with here today. The facts are the estimated death toll of nearly 3,000 from Hurricane Maria last year in Puerto Rico was the result of an in-depth scientific study by researchers from George Washington University's Milken Institute School of Public Health. Not a political party, as Ple uh, President Trump tweeted today. I think the Puerto Rico was an incredible, unsung success. President Trump continues to defend his administration's response to Hurricane Maria, which devastated Puerto Rico last year. This morning, he tweeted, 3,000 people did not die in the two hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico. When I left the island after the storm had hit, they had anywhere from 6 to 18 deaths. Then, a long time later, they started to report really large numbers like 3,000. This was done by the Democrats in order to make me look as bad as possible, end quote. The president's tweet caught some on Capitol Hill off guard. Right, sir. The president is blaming Democrats for the Puerto Rico death toll because the death toll is not accurate. What do you make of that? I don't know anything about that. A government commissioned report estimates nearly 3,000 people did die in Puerto Rico six months after Maria's impact. That's up from the initial death toll of 64. The casualties uh, mounted for a long time. So I have no reason to dispute those numbers. San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulin Cruz tweeted, This is what denial following neglect looks like. Mr. Prez, in the real world, people died on your watch. Your lack of respect is appalling. If the president thinks that losing 3,000 lives on his watch is a success, I hate to think what he considers a failure. FEMA admits it was unprepared for Maria's destruction but says it has learned lessons that will help with future storms like Florence. Now, late today, the White House released a statement saying every death from Hurricane Maria is a horror, and the president provided unprecedented support to Puerto Rico. 
The statement went on to say President Trump was responding to the liberal media and the San Juan mayor, who we just saw, who sadly have tried to exploit the devastation by pushing out a constant stream of misinformation and false accusations. So the debate continues this evening on just how successful or unsuccessful U.S. hurricane recovery efforts have been in Puerto Rico. Pat, Jeff, back to you. Crazy, right? We should not be, uh, we should not be um, arguing over how many people died um, when those estimates are probably low, right? But, but so, so let's, let's go on, let's solve the problem. If we continue to um, argue that things are not uh, the way they are, we will be in trouble for some time to come. So this is, this, this is, these are our president's uh, slightly longer full remarks. So they did an excerpt, so just to, in, in fairness, we should listen to what he, what he said. The lessons we took from Puerto Rico. Well, I think Puerto Rico was uh, incredibly successful. Uh, Puerto Rico was actually our toughest one of all because it's an island, so you, just, you can't truck things onto it. Everything's by boat. Uh, we moved a hospital into Puerto Rico, a tremendous uh, military hospital in the form of a ship. You know that? Uh, and I actually think, and the governor's been very nice, and if you ask the governor, he'll tell you what a great job. Uh, I think probably the hardest one we had by far was Puerto Rico because of the island nature. And I actually think uh, it was one of the best jobs that's ever been done with respect to what this is all about. Puerto Rico got hit not with one hurricane, but with two. And the problem with Puerto Rico is their electric grid and their electric uh, generating plant was dead before the storms ever hit. It was in very bad shape. It was in bankruptcy. Uh, had no money. It was largely you know, it was largely closed. And when the storm hit, they had no electricity essentially before the storm. And when the storm hit, that took it out entirely. Uh, the job that FEMA and law enforcement and everybody did working along with the governor in Puerto Rico, I think, was tremendous. I think that Puerto Rico was an incredible, unsung success. Uh, Texas, we have been given A-pluses for. Uh, Florida, we've been given A-pluses for. I think, in a certain way, the best job we did was Puerto Rico, but nobody would understand that. I mean, that's, it's harder to understand. It was a very hard, very hard thing to do uh, because of the fact they had no electric. Before the storms hit, it was dead, as you probably know. So uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, receptivity, a lot of thanks for the job we've done in Puerto Rico. So, yeah. So, um, so, um, it's, it's hard to completely parse this, and we, we need to get on to other things, but I'll just say that um, uh, a common thing that I've seen over the years in, in working with disasters in the coastal zone is um, these are very hard things to do, right? These are, these are hard things to respond to no matter what. The, the most well-intentioned folks with the most resources, it's, it's, a very, it's very easy to screw things up. Uh, I would suggest it's inappropriate to say that everything went fanta fantastically well when, for example, in the case of Puerto Rico, we had thousands and thousands of our fellow citizens die, right? Now, we could talk about, well, it was hard to get this done, but, but it, it, um, I would suggest to you that it paints the wrong picture, and the wrong picture in, the con in this context of coastal management, to say everything's great, right? Rather, we should bring a critical eye to these challenges. And how can we do better? How can we do better? Of course, some people are going to die when these, when these events happen. But we want to work to making sure that we minimize the impact. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to beat this to, to death. But I think you guys get, get the point. Um, uh, the politics now have become a major, major hurdle to getting folks saved, to getting these resources protected, and to getting to a better, more sustainable place for our, our society and the resources in the particular area. So, um, so that, that's a quick overview of, of the situation. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? OK, so that's, that's the context of, uh, of our, our super exciting uh, hurricane right now hitting the East Coast. Um, and I guess I'll just finish up the last slide here before we switch is uh, to say that, um, you know, we do do a lot of this stuff. So some of you guys are doing service learning stuff in some of your other classes. Great. 
Um, but we also uh, go to New Orleans in, in our case, and you guys are welcome to come with us. These are some of our students um, in uh, Buras, Louisiana, which is where the eye of the hurricane uh, made landfall in Louisiana uh, when Katrina uh, made landfall. And some folks that are still working to, to um, recover their, their community um, all these years uh, since the 2005 sucker made, made landfall. <laughs>